breaking news into NFL Network. Former Patriots quarterback Tom Brady has an agreement to join the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Peyton Manning's going to be a Bronco. There's no question about that. It looks like Deion Sanders' comeback is for real. We made the decision I was going to be a Saint. Ah, free agency. Familiar faces and new places. Do you know who signed the biggest free agent contract in NFL history? Did you know 49% of players who suited up in Super Bowl 55 were acquired in free agency? Including this guy. Brady looking, those toward the end zone. Hot ball, touchdown Tampa Bay Buccaneers! This offseason ritual is as vital to today's game as the combine, the draft, and training camp. But it's complicated, and it's more recent than you think. So how did we get here? This is NFL Explained, the evolution of free agency. When the NFL was founded in 1920, roster consistency was a major point of emphasis. Competition between rival clubs, college programs, and regular everyday jobs limited team building in the early years. But things began to change in 1925 with the arrival of American superhero Red Grange, football's first salaried player. He's still the fastest heavyweight player to streak down the field with a ball. Who is he? Red Grange, the one and only. Still, big names were the exception until the College to Pro pipeline was established by the first NFL draft in 1936. As the NFL evolved, it adopted elements of other sports leagues, like the MLB's reserve rule. Now this system, for better or worse, tied a player to a team indefinitely. Once a player's contract expired, he could only negotiate a new contract with that same team. If a deal was not reached, the player was put on the reserve list, effectively barring him from negotiating with another team. In this system, players could only change teams via trade or by retiring first. This state of affairs would persist for over two decades as dynasties were built around superstars like Green Bay's Don Hudson and Washington's Sammy Baugh. Every time he throws a football, completes a pass, gains a yard, scores a touchdown, Baugh sets a world record. But then, war. By 1942, nearly a third of the league had been drafted to fight overseas. The Army kept drafting football players. It came to the point where they drafted all our fullbacks so that the Bears were out of fullbacks. The team had to persuade Bronco Nagurski out of retirement effectively making him the first superstar free agent. They knew the guy hadn't played in six years. They knew his legs were dead. He had gained some weight, so they put him at tackle. The formation of the All-American Football Conference in 1946 added yet another wrinkle. The new league's timely arrival, along with wartime uncertainty, led to some players backing out on their draft day agreements. Legendary receiver Max Speedy was drafted by the NFL's Detroit Lions in 1942 but owner Fred Mandel didn't want to sign him until he returned from duty. Meanwhile, Speedy was enticed by several AAFC offers, eventually signing with Paul Brown in Cleveland for $7,000. You snooze, you lose, Fred. Cleveland is overjoyed. The Browns are the champions of the world again. College phenom Speck Sanders, great name, was drafted by Washington in 1942, but jumped leagues to play for the AAFC's Yankees in 46. Two years later, future Hall of Famer Y.A. Tittle rejected the Lions to sign with the AAFC's Baltimore Colts. This massive shift in player demand led the NFL to introduce the one-year option rule in 1947. Teams could only use the reserve clause once after a player's contract expired. In turn, players could then negotiate and sign with another team after their option year was fulfilled but it took 14 years for someone to switch teams under this rule. That someone was receiver R.C. Owens, who left San Francisco to sign with the Colts in 1962. Speaking of the Colts, they landed one of the first and biggest free agent names of all time. I think you may have heard of him. Unitas is back, Unitas throws, four goes for a touchdown! A magnificent pass pattern with Johnny Unitas. The Steelers originally drafted Johnny Unitas in 1955, but were unimpressed, releasing him before the season began. That actually happened. Then a year later, Johnny U signed in Baltimore, where he would win three MVPs, four NFL championships, setting multiple passing records as the NFL's first modern quarterback. But by 1960, another rival league was quickly gaining traction. 
The most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 with the birth of the American Football League. The AFL's spending power made draft competition fierce, raising salaries for top-tier college prospects. Now, with owners growing restless, Commissioner Pete Rozelle moved to discourage player movement through the Rozelle Rule in 1963. The rule gave Rozelle authority to compensate teams who had lost players in free agency. The price of the free agent was decided by the commissioner's office and would be paid by the player's new team, usually in the form of draft picks or cash considerations. It had the intended effect. Only 34 players signed with new clubs between 1963 and 1974, as most teams avoided the heavy cost of signing veteran talent. Offense in the air in Dave Parks. The 49ers have the NFL's top pass receiver. In 1968, the Saints provided a cautionary tale coughing up two first-round picks to sign receiver Dave Parks. Parks failed to produce, never catching more than 35 passes in any of his five seasons in the Big Easy. The AFL and NFL had agreed not to pursue each other's players once they signed their initial deals. In 1966, this pact was broken when the Giants signed soccer-style kicker Pete Gogolak away from the AFL's bills. The upstart league was furious over Gogolak. Enter Al Davis. Just win, baby. Before Davis was a staple of NFL excellence, he was arguably the league's fiercest adversary in the mid-1960s. Already the youngest owner and coach in the AFL, Davis was promoted to commissioner in April of 66 and immediately went after the NFL talent in retaliation. Within months, the league was in talks with NFL veterans Mike Ditka, John Brody, and Roman Gabriel. His hardball tactics were maybe too successful, and the leagues agreed, without Davis's knowledge, to a merger in July of that same year. We would come out of it a much stronger organization and a much greater sport than we have been as two separate entities. With a rival pool of owners no longer around to drive up salaries, tension rose between players and the league. In 1976, the NFL Players Union won a court decision against the Roselle Rule. The settlement created a revision known as Right of First Refusal and Compensation. It worked similarly to restricted free agency today. The rule gave a player's original team the right to match any contract offered to him by another team. If a deal was reached, the player's new team was required to compensate his original team based on the player's experience and new salary. Brock back to pass, the rush out to <laughs> Washington made a huge splash signing Bears linebacker Wilbur Marshall to a free agent deal in 1988. Marshall became the first player to change teams via free agency in 11 years. Washington signed the Pro Bowler to a five-year, $6 million deal and had to give up two first-round picks under the league's compensation rules. In 1989, the NFL instituted the Plan B system, the precursor to modern free agency. Plan B was relatively straightforward. Teams could protect 37 of its 47 rostered players, but the 10 remaining Plan B free agents could not negotiate with any other team until they provided their old team the chance to resign them first. I tell you, did you see that hit there, Ronnie yes. Lodge? <laughs> they almost knocked his uniform off. What a run by Roger Craig. You'll never see a better one than that. Two big name players, Ronnie Lott, Roger Craig. They left the 49ers for the Raiders via Plan B in 1991. But the new system wasn't well received by the players and lawsuits continued. In 1992, the final blow came by the way of the Minneapolis Federal Court, which ruled in favor of NFL plaintiffs, making them unrestricted free agents. Reggie White, the legend, the all-pro, the Eagles' minister of defense, became the face of the free agency movement. The Reggie White settlement in January of 1993, introduced free agency as we know it now. And it goes something like this. Unrestricted free agents are what we can consider true free agents. That's any player who has at least four years of NFL experience and an expiring contract. I was really impressed when I came up here the first time. Man. Green Bay was the farthest thing from my mind. And with the direction the team is going, I think they, they have a total commitment to winning. White became the first unrestricted free agent in 1993, leaving Philadelphia to sign a four-year, $17 million contract with the Packers. He and Brett Favre would go on to bring Green Bay its first title 
in nearly three decades. The Vince Lombardi Trophy is coming home! Players with three years of NFL experience and an expiring contract are considered restricted free agents. These players are eligible for one-year qualifying offers, or tenders, from their original team. If the player accepts the offer, he can negotiate deals with other teams until a certain date, but stays with his original team if the offer sheet is matched. Everybody keeping up? Heck yeah! Woo! Good. The impact of free agency was immediate as some of the league's biggest stars entered the open market. The first year we saw dozens of big names swap jerseys. Raiders legend Marcus Allen bolted for the Chiefs. Linebacker Kevin Green made an immediate impact in Pittsburgh. Ronnie Lott went from LA to the Jets. Vinny Testaverde joined Bill Belichick with the Browns. And that was just the beginning. Primetime, Deion Sanders, high step to the 49ers, and a Super Bowl title in 1994. Then did it again just the following year to Dallas, where Jerry Jones served up a whopping five-year, $30 million offer to pry Prime away from his NFC rival. This is Deion. He got one here. All of the success has led to some monster money for high-profile free agents. Let's take a look at how big-time free agent contracts have evolved on the defensive side. Reggie White's $17 million contract made him the highest paid defender in 1993. All-pro Javon Kurse, the freak, left the Titans in 2004 to sign in Philly, making him the highest paid D-lineman at the time. Albert Hainsworth signed history's biggest defensive contract in 2009 before Indomitian and Sue topped that in 2015 with a six-year, $114 million deal with the Dolphins. You can't forget Charles Woodson, who reinvigorated his Hall of Fame career signing with the Packers in 2006. He went on to win Defensive Player of the Year in 09 and won a Super Bowl in 2010. And it's picked off by Charles Woodson! Touchdown, Pack! Speaking of a career renaissance, how about Rich Gannon? Gannon won league MVP after signing with Oakland in 1999. Two-time MVP and 2005 free agent Kurt Warner resurrected his career in the desert, leading the Cardinals to Super Bowl 43. And then there's Brady. 20-year run in New England wasn't quite good enough. Surprising everyone, he left the Patriots and signed a two-year $50 million free agent deal with Tampa Bay. And all he did next was throw for 40 touchdowns in 2020, taking down Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, and finally Patrick Mahomes and route to a seventh Lombardi Trophy. Tom Brady, you are the man, you are the GOAT. You might ask, was Brady's $25 million a year deal the most ever for a free agent quarterback? No, not quite. We'll get to that in one second. But first, let's check out free agent deals that have evolved for the game's best offensive players. The Cardinals broke the bank for Pro Bowl receiver Gary Clark. Six million for a free agent receiver was uncharted territory in 1993. Then, restricted free agent Curtis Martin signed a massive deal with the Jets in 1998, led them to the AFC Championship game. After a shoulder injury pushed Drew Brees out of San Diego, the future all-time passing leader saw a really nice payday from the Saints in 06 and was worth every penny. Brees. Wide open. Wide open! What a way to do it! There is, of course, Peyton Manning, who landed in Denver after a neck injury ended his legendary Colts career. He went on to produce two more All-Pro seasons and a win in Super Bowl 50. Manning out of the gun. Manning lets it fly. It's caught by Thomas! There's the record for Peyton Manning! Great job! Great job! We mentioned Brady's $25 million annual guaranteed salary. But did you know Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins actually earned the highest guaranteed free agent deal in NFL history? That's right. In 2018, Minnesota signed Cousins, the Pro Bowler, to a three-year contract worth $28 million a year. But writing huge checks doesn't always mean success. Larry Brown with a big interception. Remember Larry Brown? Not the NBA coach. Cornerback Larry Brown parlayed his Super Bowl MVP into a nice contract with the Raiders, but started in just one game for the Silver and Black. They tried another reigning Super Bowl MVP the year after, but Packers hero Desmond Howard didn't fare much better, accounting for just two touchdowns in two seasons. But maybe no team knows how a huge free agent deal can backfire better than you know who, Washington. Oh man, the franchise doled out 
massive contracts to Adam Archuleta and Deion Sanders, neither of which played more than a single season in Washington. Maybe the most disruptive inside force in the league right now is Albert Hainsworth. And then, of course, Hainsworth. Two-time All-Pro with the Titans, great player, but his $100 million deal resulted in just 12 starts in D.C. The low will throw from inside his five, going for Steve Smith, and it is picked off by Nandi Osamwa. In 2011, the Eagles offered a five-year, $60 million deal to Raiders Pro Bowler Nandi Osamwa before releasing him two years later. In 2015, Philly signed cornerback Byron Maxwell and reigning offensive player of the year, DeMarco Murray, to massive multi-year deals. Both players were gone the following season. The free agency game is as much about value as it is about player success. Sometimes it's all about finding the diamonds in the rough. On third down, Palmer standing in the pocket and picked off, it's James Ferrier to the touchdown. In 2002, the Steelers found a gem signing former first-round pick James Ferrier for pennies on the dollar. Ferrier would blossom in Pittsburgh, recording six seasons with 100-plus tackles, an all-pro nod, and two Super Bowls on one of the league's friendliest contracts. London Fletcher, incredible player, landed in Washington on a five-year, $25 million deal and would become a perennial pro bowler, earning four straight nods and consistently ranking among the league's leading tacklers. How about Rodney? All-Pro safety Rodney Harrison won back-to-back -back Lombardis after inking a six-year deal worth just under $15 million with the Patriots in 2003. Intercepted! Rodney Harrison at the 20. He falls down, and that is it! The Patriots are going to be Super Bowl champions again! Super talented Cardinals pass rusher Simeon Rice was lured to Tampa in 01 on a five-year deal worth just over $30 million. He rewarded them with multiple 10-plus sack seasons and an All-Pro selection in the Bucs 2002 Super Bowl season. The same year Rice signed in Tampa, the mother of all bargains landed in Kansas City. Roll the highlight reel. Here he goes, he's up, he's up, touchdown! And he now holds the record for most touchdowns in a season. How do you not love Priest? Arriving on a very modest five-year, $8.5 million deal, Priest Holmes went full supernova for the Chiefs and won you all the fantasy titles. He rattled off three All-Pro seasons, netting a ridiculous 6,500 yards from scrimmage and 61 total touchdowns over that span. So with all this talent flying around, owners need to find some sort of compromise. And that came in the form of franchise and transition tax. During negotiations in 1993, Broncos owner Pat Bolin was terrified that he'd lose All-Pro John Elway and demanded a method for teams to protect their top talent. The resulting Elway rule was born, creating the tag structure and adding an extra level of complexity. How does it work? Glad you asked. If a team wishes to retain an upcoming unrestricted free agent, they can use their franchise tag on a single player, which extends that player's contract an extra year a player can be tagged up to three times by their team. There are two types of franchise tags. An exclusive tag is exactly what the name implies. The player is locked into his team and cannot negotiate with any other team during the free agency period. The one-year deal must pay him the average of the top five highest paid players at his position or 120% of his previous year's salary, whichever is higher. Needing seven yards, Breeze throws in zone, touchdown! The all-time single-season NFL passing record. This is what the Saints did with Drew Brees in 2012. Brees was able to negotiate a five-year deal before the start of the season. The more common version is the non-exclusive tag. For a slightly lower price, it can lock up a player for another year, but does not prevent that player from negotiating longer-term deals with other teams. If a player signs elsewhere, his original team is granted two first-round picks. And then there's the transition tag, which allows a team to match any offer, but does not guarantee compensation if the player leaves. These three tags give leverage to teams and are generally used to negotiate longer term deals with their franchise players. While Elway and Steve Young were the first to receive the franchise tag, teams soon started using the rule as a negotiation tactic for players of all positions. Tony Gonzalez refused to sign his franchise tender in 2001 arguing his worth was far beyond the salary of typical tight ends. By 02, he signed the most lucrative tight end deal in history at that time, seven years, 31 million. No tight end in the NFL 
NFL has ever caught as many touchdown passes as Tony Gonzalez. The Seahawks tagged Sean Alexander in 2005, who bet on himself in a big way, delivering a record-setting MVP season on a one-year deal. Alexander, wide open. The record is yours. Then he signed a massive eight-year, $62 million contract with Seattle that offseason. Michael Vick's 2010 resurgence in Philly earned him a franchise designation in 2011 before the two sides worked out a long-term deal with nearly $40 million guaranteed. Rushing four, ball comes out of the hand. Vaughn Miller did it again. He knocked it out of the hands of Newton. In 2016, Denver tagged Super Bowl MVP Vaughn Miller before settling on a payday to the tune of $70 million in guaranteed money. And Kirk Cousins, the free agency legend, signed two consecutive franchise tags in Washington, and that was before his record-setting deal with the Vikings. Roethlisberger on again. Leaving on Bell, the cut. Bell breaks a tackle. Bell trying to go all the way. In 2017, Le'Veon Bell had an all-pro year under the franchise tag, but sat out the entire 2018 season after the team tagged him yet again. He would garner $35 million in guaranteed money from the Jets the following season. All right, my friends, before we wrap this up, let's dive into free agents of the undrafted variety. We love these. Undrafted free agents are treated as unrestricted free agents and can negotiate and sign with any team. These players date back to the 1940s when the AAFC's Browns discovered gems like Marion Motley and Lou Groza. Warren Moon was passed over in the 1978 draft, but was signed by the Oilers in 84 after a stint in the Canadian Football League. Moon had a 17-year Hall of Fame career in the NFL, passing for nearly 50,000 yards and 300 touchdowns. Green Bay struck gold in 1960 by scooping up undrafted future Hall of Famer Willie Wood, but didn't have quite the same luck in 1994 when they waived unknown rookie Kurt Warner. Rainbow's the far sideline, and it is caught by Isaac Bruce. Makes a move to the 30, 25, 20, and they won't catch him today. Yeah. Possibly the league's best Cinderella story. No, I'm going to say it. Definitely the league's best Cinderella story. Warner went on to sign with the Rams in 1999, leading St. Louis to a win in Super Bowl 34. In 2001, Warner's second title was snatched away by Adam Vinatieri, another undrafted Super Bowl hero. Legendary slot receiver Wes Welker was skipped over in 04, as was Steelers linebacker James Harrison two years earlier. The aforementioned Priest Holmes is also on that list, as is Broncos legend Rod Smith, the Cowboys' Tony Romo, and Canton-bound tight end Antonio Gates. 112 career touchdown catches. That's the most by an NFL tight end. But maybe the greatest undrafted free agent ever is Hall of Fame defensive back Dick Night Train Lane. Signed by the Rams in 1952, Night Train picked off 14 passes as a rookie, still an NFL record. He retired with seven All-Pro seasons and the second most career interceptions in NFL history. So there you have it. You are now schooled on all things free agency, and I hope you had a little fun. The veil of mystery is finally lifted. See you next time.